With this latest chapter of My Hero Academia, Class 1A leaves UA for good, Deku and Uraraka finally express their honest feelings with one another, and the second war finally begins. With the previous chapter, we follow the perspective of Toga as she revisited her childhood home, a now thoroughly ransacked and vandalized abode that had been tarnished in several ways, all for the sake of pointing blame at not only Toga, but her family as well. Here she would recount the words and sentiments of her parents and peers, all of whom desired for her to be different from the way she actually was. When Toga returned to her room, it was rather bare, unlike how it had been previously. And in recounting the memories of what had previously been, she remembered a certain dream of hers. As she pierced into her own arm with her teeth and nourished upon her blood, she'd think of being like a bird or being like a girl she admired, all the while imagining a red sparrow to be tap dancing on her stomach before burrowing deep inside her as it continued its jubilant jig. Doing so as it splashed about and stained her red, what Toga considered to be a wonderful dream that made her oh so happy. Outside there was Dobby who was surprised by the sentimentality of his peer, then going on to question her resolve, asking if she was truly ready to bring an end to the world as they know it. Which she indeed was, as it was too late to turn back now. A response which delighted Dobby as he would then set her former home ablaze expressing that they should smile, because smiling is why they live their lives. A sort of twisted rendition of All Might's teachings, from which point it would be revealed that when Twice died, he gathered some of the blood before Giganto Machia took them all elsewhere. Blood that he has since given to Toga on account of her ability to replicate the quirk of those she loves, an application of her quirk that the heroes actually have no idea about, so they will most definitely be in for quite the surprise here. We would then be taken back to the hideout of the villains, where Spinner would be concerned about Shigaraki's well-being, as he would grossly shift his physical being as he agonized in pain. Despite this, All For One would make it clear that Shigaraki was recovering well as he overcame the quirk singularity doomsday theory, something that All For One cared a great deal about. From there we would have the heteromorphic prejudice of the world brought up, with Spinner now set to be their messiah, a role he would accept for the sake of Shigaraki. With this latest chapter titled The Calm Before the Storm, we would begin with the emergency living quarters. Here there was a pretty calm community of people, and we'd even see the UA bots being used for new purposes like helping an old lady move a box. However, things weren't all so cheerful, as we would have some of All For One's spies present. Apparently All For One expected them to be unable to do much within the UA barrier. Their main objective was to stir up trouble and push those who possessed animosity towards the heroes. The heroes knew that Shigaraki would be able to move in less than a week, but were hiding just how badly they were struggling, and so it was up to these infiltrators to fan the flames and make it so that Deku would not be able to return to Yue. And so with this, we know that All For One is betting on the new time frame provided to the heroes on account of Shigaraki's fight against Star, and so there wouldn't be any surprises found there. I have to wonder what sort of situations these characters may possess that would lead them in the palm of the villain's hands like this, but I doubt they'll be all too important in regards to these specifics. But now on to the student dorms, these kids were exhausted. So much so that Kaminari collapsed on the floor upon returning, unable to move at all. And this was on account of their search efforts which actually covered a great span of distance because their forces were stretched so thinly. What could have very well been covered on screen as we see they are all a bit banged up, so conflict is to be expected, but I suppose Horiko she just wants to hurry up and get to the end as opposed to providing us with that sort of coverage. From there we would have Ida's new costume which looked really cool, especially the half mask thing that he has going on something that Horikoshi had previously teased. For me, this is probably the coolest the character has ever looked in the story itself, and I actually think it's safe to say that he has one of the best costumes in this series as well. And he would be his usual self, telling them all to get some rest and such. We would then have Mineta being weird as usual, but what he said would prompt Deku to consider their lack of free time as of late. With how busy they all are, they barely had any time to talk to one another as he looked over to Araka, who was with Mina at the time remembering that he still hadn't thanked her for what she had done on his behalf. But to interrupt this thought, it would be All Might, Tsukauchi, and Principal Nezu. Here they would inform the young students about their plans for this climactic battle, their final plans for the second war. And you know, it's times like these where I wonder what our third year UA students are even doing. And I don't mean the same three kids that we've been shown. Hell, is Class 1B going to play a role at all? I get that these are top secret plans and all that, but damn, we are nearing the end of this series here, and I can't help but think about all the absent factors. But anyways, we would have some visuals of our plan makers discussing things. Now the most telling expression here comes from Endeavor, who upon inspection of the plan on paper, 
which I don't understand why they would put something so hush-hush and secretive on paper, but whatever. Endeavor looked to be especially saddened by it, what one may only presume to be related to his son Toya. Considering their need to split the villains up, I'd imagine he is the best bait possible to do so when it comes to Dobby. What I imagine is quite troublesome, but is something that he absolutely needs to face, as not facing his son is precisely how that predicament came to be in the first place. We would then also have Eraserhead looking to Kuragiri, along with the emphasis shot of his missing eye as Oyama sat behind bars. I really wonder if Eraserhead will be able to play an active role in this final confrontation, or if these injuries are truly the end of his hero days. The loss of an eye is most definitely a nerf, so we'll just have to see, I suppose. After that, we would have shots of our Class 1A Big 3, with Bakugo looking the coolest of the bunch, with his domino mask on his forehead like a Naruto headband. A very simple shot, but a very cool one for sure. From there, apparently, Principal Nezu had announced the impending assault of Shigaraki to come in four days' time. As much of the infiltrator's surprise, Class 1A was leaving of their own accord. They would then thank everyone for putting up with their presence. Deku had now fully recuperated, and it was now time for them to go. To the civilians, Snipe would express how important their safety was, and would only ask that when the evacuations do begin, that they don't panic and remain hopeful. Now, the infiltrators were absolutely delighted by this, as without even lifting a finger, all had gone according to All For One's plans, as Deku had left the safety of Yue, as they now felt their future to be guaranteed. But as these haters looked on, we would have some touching moments between our various cast members. There are a lot of them, so I'll just focus on the few that stuck out to me for the sake of brevity. Deku hugging his mother goodbye made my heart melt. It is easily the most emotional expression here, as really and truly, Deku's life is on the line more than anyone else's. These two are both chronic criers, but here, no tears are shed, and I think that that says a whole lot. Next, we have Shoji shaking hands with the large woman Deku had previously saved. And with all this on top of the sketches he has recently done, I get the feeling that Horikoshi is especially fond of this character. Shoji himself isn't exactly popular or even of particular importance compared to all the others displayed in this collage, so I'd have to say that his inclusion here with her is based on their heteromorphic disposition. With the spinner stuff, an inclusion like this is to be of increased weight. That being said, as someone hailing from a historically downtrodden minority group myself, I'm really curious to see what Horikoshi has planned with these depictions. So far, when it comes to morality and justice, I can't say that the messaging has been all too strong or realistically applicable in this series for me, so I am a bit thrown off by all of this, but we'll just have to wait and see how things go. From there, we would have some civilians that we may recognize, but the one I find to be the most fascinating would be the big guy in the back, as I in fact believe this to be Death Arms, a former hero turned civilian in the face of these troublesome times. And with how active other characters have been, such as Mount Lady, it's honestly a bit pathetic to see him like this. And then lastly, we would have the two children that Deku has saved in the very same shot, Eri and Kota, which I think is just really cute. But perhaps even more importantly, here we get to see that Eri's horn is still very small. And so with that, we can't exactly bet on her assistance. From there, we would find ourselves with the new base of operations for our young heroes, the prototype stronghold by the name of Troy. Now, if you're familiar with our Greek mythology mega theory, then you would know that we have accurately predicted a vast number of details about the furtherance of this story based on such things. So yeah, the name Troy is to be of note, as Troy was once a great city, which was eventually besieged and conquered by a Greek army. What is a rather famous tale on account of the Trojan horse, which makes a whole lot of sense considering just how greatly the heroes intend to rely upon bait and such in their planning. From Deku to Endeavor to Oyama, plenty of bait to go around. But yeah, this place was rather quickly made by the combined efforts of Cementos, Ectoplasm, and Power Loader. What I imagine is close to being the greatest construction team possible, and would be if they had Momo. At the very least, the place should be able to take a good beating, which they were actually counting on. And the interior of the building was intended to be similar to the dorms they were now so used to. But once they dropped their things off, Deku would notice from outside his window, Uraraka, who was by her lonesome. And he would immediately take the opportunity to speak with her. The two would make small talk about only bringing so much stuff along with them before a silence would be had. One which Deku would break by finally thanking Uraraka for what she had done for him. With this gratitude, Uraraka would be a bit flustered as she would move her hair all about while avoiding eye contact with him. Deku would then wonder what she was doing outside as she would express that she was just watching the city. Another silence would come about and here, I am a big fan of how this conversation was being paneled and their expressions are really well done. 
Uraka would then consider herself to be an oddball. With that, Deku would begin to shower her with compliments as she would then clarify what she really meant. She'd say that when she was shouting from the top of the building back then, for a moment, Toga's face came to mind. She'd tell him about their encounter back when Makia was rampaging, and that at the time, she replied to Toga with something she truly believed to be correct. However, that response of hers brought about the most sorrowful expression Uraka had ever seen. Now, notice how Uraka speaks of her beliefs in the past tense. She's beginning to question and shift her thinking here. And I must say that sentiment of hers about Toga's face being the most sorrowful one she'd ever seen, we all saw Toga's face. She was sad, sure, but it really didn't look that crazy. And the same goes for Shigaraki's face previously with Deku when he saw someone who needed to be saved. The visual conveyance just isn't there, so we're kind of just left to take the character's word for it. Uraka would look to the city and recall all the atrocities committed by the League of Villains, all of which she knew to be irredeemable. Yet even still, she couldn't help but consider what Toga's perspective on right and wrong would be like, something she didn't understand at all, as she really and truly didn't know Toga at all. And so she was looking to the city, so she would never forget what the villains had done. She was trying to force herself not to feel anything for such vicious destroyers. But Deku would express his understanding, much to her surprise. He would then tell her about the crying little boy that he saw inside Shigaraki. That despite an inability to avoid conflict at this point, he didn't want to ignore that aspect of him. Uraka would then look at them for a while before believing them both to be quite odd. Which I'm not too sure about, I mean considering the prior sentiments of their entire class, I'm led to believe that they all think like this for some reason or another. I think introspection and consideration of others is a wonderful thing and will most definitely set these characters apart from their predecessors, however, it's just too contextually unreasonable for me to truly grab hold of in most cases. Anyways, we would then move on to Shoto, who is with some of the other guys in his class. Ido would then express his understanding of Shoto's predicament as someone who also has a brother, but Shoto would stress the difference in their situations as he didn't know the first thing about his brother Toya. From which point, Bakugo would bet that he loves Udon, something that made Shoto smile as he would express a desire to eat dinner with him sometime. Again, I understand the placement of optimism here, but the execution is just so strange to me. Things like this just come off as inhuman more than anything else, and at times I attempt to rationalize by considering them to be an emphasis on the heroic and or chivalrous nature of these characters, but then I think about the western comic stories that inspired Horikoshi to begin with. Stories like those of Spider-Man, that despite being one of the most selfless characters of all time, manages to be exceptionally relatable and human all the way through. Deku and Uraraka would again vow to stop the villains as all for one with a smile was now ready to get started. The operation begins today. This may very well be the last peaceful chapter we see for quite some time, perhaps until the very end of the story, and I'm not sure how aware everyone is, but although we know the series is ending this year, that does not mean the series will be coming to a close at the very end of the year. In fact, it's entirely possible that the manga may be ending when season 6 of the anime is just beginning. Either way, I hope we can enjoy the time we have left with the series and have a whole lot of fun in the process. And on the topic of fun, we have another channel in the works by the name of Plot Armor comics where we plan to provide you guys with dedicated and fun western comic coverage on par with what you guys can expect from us when it comes to anime and manga. We would really appreciate the support of the plot army over there just like we already do over here. And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to Plot Armor with notifications on, because when it comes to bringing you some of the best My Hero Academia content on the platform, Plot Armor has you covered. As always, I'm Slice of Otaku, thank you all so much for watching and have an awesome day. I love you.